It's my pleasure and honor to introduce the plenary speaker today, who is Professor Laura Waller. She leads the um, Computational Imaging Lab at the University of California at Berkeley, in the, which is in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, she holds the Ted Van Duzer Endowed Pro Professorship, and she's a senior fellow at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science, which has affiliations in bioengineering and applied sciences and technology. Um, she was a postdoc before um, coming to uh, UC uh, Berkeley in the Bay Area. She was a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer of physics at Princeton University. And she received all of her degrees, undergraduate masters and doctorate degree at uh, MIT. She's a Moore Foundation data-driven investigator, a BACAR fellow, a NSF career awardee, and a Packard fellow, among other things. And today she's going to talk to us about the work that she and her colleagues are doing at Berkeley on a microscopy. Thank you very much, Laura. Thanks. Great, thanks for inviting me. Um, so I think a lot of people here are working on cameras, uh, probably most likely for photography type things. And I want to talk about um, these new ideas in computational imaging and how we're using them to improve microscopy by rethinking how you build your imaging systems and how you process your data. So uh, the main idea of computational imaging is that you're designing your hardware and software together exploiting whatever synergies you can. So I don't go design the best camera to get the best possible 2D image at the sensor and then maybe extract some image from it later in post-processing. What I need to do to call it computational imaging is to design the whole thing at once, to figure out what my hardware should be and how it will work with whatever algorithms or inverse problem software I want to use to get back something uh, better than each could do alone or something different. Sometimes you can ac access information by making indirect measurements that you otherwise couldn't. So the general idea has two pieces. And you have some object that you're trying to image. And you have some measurements at your sensor. Why? It's usually a 2D focal plane array. Um, and you get to design your imaging system. So this is the sort of art that goes into it. How do I, what sort of optics should I put into it? And how should I trade off cost versus simplicity versus uh, performance? And then the second piece is find x. So take these measurements y and find x. This is a straightforward in inverse problem. Um, and we call this the algorithm piece. But the key about computational imaging is that these things should talk to each other, that they should feed into each other. What you have available in your algorithms toolbox should inform what your optical design is, and vice versa. OK, so to give a more concrete example, I'll start with this life yield uh, camera, which probably most people have heard of. You have to modify the hardware. So you take your camera, and you stick a, an array of lenses in there, and you take a picture that looks like garbage. So this picture looks like garbage, but it also contains different information than you otherwise would have. So you can send it to your computer, solve your inverse problem, and get back this nice, beautiful image that uh, also has depth information in it. Right. So you can digitally refocus or change their perspective after the fact from a single captured image. This is something you could never do with a regular camera. right? So uh, light field imaging has become super popular in photography. Lytra has introduced the, the commercial versions of it. Um, but where we work is something different. So we're in a different realm of optics. We're in this place where wave optics matters. So uh, photography pretty much always talks about ray optics because things are big relative to the size of the wavelength. And so you don't need to care much about diffraction and interference effects in the usual case. When you do microscopy, your stuff that you're looking at is actually smaller. It's towards the same size scale as the wavelength that you're using. And so that's when you have to consider diffraction and interference effects. That's what limits your resolution. That's what causes all kinds of different effects in your images that need to be modeled. So we're, we're working in this wave optics regime, which is sort of one level of generality above ray optics. So it's more complicated, but it also has these opportunities for more degrees of freedom. So when you talk about wave optics, you're really talking about treating your light as a wave. It has an amplitude and a phase. And so a huge part of what my lab does, and pretty much everything we do, involves some sort of phase retrieval, which is the idea that you can never measure your phase directly. Optical phase is changing too quickly. It's too small to measure directly. You have to measure it through intensity measurements, 
which are related to the phase, so x now is a complex vector, and we're making measurements of intensity or absolute value squared. So we make these nonlinear measurements of a complex field. We get to play around with what our, our complex transfer functions are, and from the, those sort of clever designs, we can figure out ways to reconstruct phase information from intensity measurements. So this has been around for a very long time. Tons of people have been working on this, decades of research into different ways of doing phase imaging. And the reason why is because it's so important. If I have an unstained, unlabeled cell, like this is a cheek cell scraped from my student's cheek, um, you can't see them, right? They're invisible. They're the same refractive index. They're the same, uh, approximately the same refractive index as the water that they're floating in, and they're not absorbing any light. So they're invisible. If you can measure phase, you can see them. You can map out their shape and density. So it's an important problem. Uh, and we're only going to talk here about quantitative phase imaging, which means that your shape and density maps are quantitative. So this has to be computational. And there's a lot of different ways that we have solved this problem. But I want to talk about one particular one that I think is really exciting. Um, this is something we've been working on for a couple of years now. Um, it started out by copying a group at Caltech, putting this LED array onto our microscope. And it's sort of expanded into a lot of different imaging modalities that can be achieved um, really easily with the same hardware setup that's cheap and simple and just using different algorithms and methods to design uh, your capture and, and inverse problem. So I'll start with the simplest one, and it's just about looking at different contrast modes. So here's our setup. Uh, it's a microscope, one of the oldest microscopes you can find that's infinity corrected. And we've simply removed the illumination unit here and replaced it with this LED array. It's a programmable LED array. Adafruit is literally a children's toy company um, controlled by Arduinos. And you can just choose which LEDs you turn on. OK. So when I turn on different LEDs, effectively what I'm doing, this thing's just sitting above our sample. So turning on different LEDs, basically just amounts to illuminating the object from different directions. So the object sees homogeneous intensity illumination all the time, but it's got different uh, patterns of directional uh, information coming in at the sample. So this is what we're coding. We're coding illumination angles. And from this, we can do all of these different modalities that I showed you before, and I'll explain each one. OK, so by turning on these LEDs and patterning your illumination angles, we get a super fast way of modulating our imaging system. It's really simple because you just stick it on on top of the existing microscope, and it's cheap. This thing is like $100 or less, including the Arduino. OK, so how, how should we modulate these patterns? And I'll show you later where this one comes from. Well, let's think about the simplest stuff. So if I just turn on a bunch of the LEDs, I get a regular image. In microscopy, we call this a bright field image. If I turn on the outside LEDs, if they correspond to angles that are so large that they don't pass through the microscope's objective lens, then this is a dark field picture. You're illuminating from such a high angle that the illumination doesn't pass to the camera, but light that scatters off the object can pass into the camera. So you see these sort of uh, things light up that are small scale features that are beyond the diffraction limit of the microscope. Um, if I light up half of the LEDs within this bright field circle, I get phase contrast. And this is super cool because people usually pay a lot of money for phase contrast and need specialized hardware. So the reason for this is asymmetry. And if you studied Fourier optics, then this makes total sense. Um, but basically, the reason why you want to do this is that you can then do uh, really quickly swapping between the different imaging modalities and capture these simultaneous videos of all three uh, of these contrast mechanisms. And these three contrast mechanisms happen to be the three most popular label-free bright field type uh, contrast mechanisms in microscopy that normally you'd have to remove physical elements um, and pay a lot of money for all of the attachments that you would put in. So this is just cheap and simple, fast way of getting at it. OK, so let me explain the phase a little bit more, because I'm going to talk a lot more about different phase methods. Um, this method that we're dealing with is called differential phase contrast. It's been around for a little while. We're doing it a totally different way um, by putting it on this LED array microscope. But the central idea is that by lighting up um, half of these LEDs, I'm illuminating the object just from one side. Illuminating from the side shifts things in Fourier space. Illuminating from the other side shifts things in Fourier space the other way. And both of these images, so the, both of these images have shifted the spectrums in opposite directions, but then it passed through 
the aperture, the pupil function of the microscope, so it got clipped. So you lose, you lose half of the spectrum in both cases. So essentially, these images correspond to what would happen if you pass through the left side of the aperture or the right side of the aperture. And since we know Fourier transforms, we know that a pure amplitude object would be purely symmetric in Fourier space. And so subtracting those two images will give you phase information. So adding them together destroys all the phase information. Subtracting them gives you phase information. And this DPC is, is basically this uh, phase information image. So we can make models for how it incorporates the phase information. This looks like differential in interference contrast. And then we can invert the problem and solve for quantitative phase. This is a lens lit array, and we're basically getting this surface shape map out of it. Um, OK, so what's cool about this is then we can like really quickly swap between the two patterns and capture these very high resolution and fast quantitative phase images. So for live cell samples, this is really key because all these small things uh, are moving really quickly, and so you better capture things quickly if you want to see them not be motion blurred out. OK, uh, these are just some examples. This is um, epithelial cells. We work a lot with a biologist at Berkeley on different applications. But probably the coolest thing that this LED array microscope can do is called, it's been called Fourier tachography. I'm just calling it gigapixel phase imaging here. It's a little more intuitive. Um, but what it is is a way of getting at high space bandwidth product. So every camera you have, you have to choose, right? Either I zoom in and get good resolution, or I zoom out and get bad resolution. So we're choosing to zoom out and get bad resolution, but by coding our illumination, we can then reconstruct an image that has good resolution across a very large field of view. So we no longer have to trade um, field of view for resolution anymore. We circumvent that trade-off by taking lots of images in a particular way. So this is really useful. I mean, a huge application for this that people are proposing is um, pathology, or I think this one is a really great one. This is uh, looking for diseases in red blood cells, which are relatively small, but you need to see inside them, and you need to sort of quantify things across tens of thousands of cells. And what results when you have uh, a lot of resolution across a large area is you're getting about towards a gigapixel of, of pixels. This is not quite there yet. This is one of the first images we've taken. Um, but you can push this even further. So here's an example. This is a resolution target. And it's a 0.1 NA objective, which really means that it's very low, uh, very small aperture, so very bad resolution. So when I zoom in on the fine features, I'm simply not resolving them. But then we do this coded aperture thing where we take a whole bunch of pictures with different illumination angles. These are the raw images that we capture. You can see they're all low-resolution images, but they're changing, which is good, right? It means we're getting different information as we change the illumination angles. And from this set of images, we can reconstruct the higher-resolution image. Um, OK, so uh, this one is going about a factor of six in either direction of resolution improvement. Um, and that's not necessarily the limit. There's just really practical reasons to stop. So how does this work? Basically, it's all about dark field images. Um, so if I think about the Fourier space of my sample, so this is the xy spatial frequency map. And this circle represents numerical aperture, which is the inverse of your f number, essentially. And so it represents your resolution. So I want to fill in a large numerical aperture in order to have high resolution. But when I choose an, a lens, I have to trade those off. I have to give away. Um, I have to give away resolution in order to get field of view. So to get field of view, I need to choose something that has small bandwidth here, so low resolution. But when I illuminate from an off-axis LED, so I turn on this LED over here, I'm illuminating off-axis, things are shifting in Fourier space, I'm essentially just picking up a circle in Fourier space that has the same area, but it's shifted to some of the higher frequencies. And this is exactly what a dark field image is. It's lighting up all of the edges of things in that particular direction, in this case, um, or vertical, and in, in the other case up here is horizontal. And these are sub-resolution features, but this image is not a super-resolution image. And so if I can figure out how to properly combine all these images, I can potentially get at this high-resolution information. Uh, in fact, I can get out to the NA that corresponds to the sum of the two. OK, so uh, that's where I mean by super-resolution. We're beating the diffraction limit of the lens that's being used. So how am I going to do this? And this is the hard part. 
is that you can't just throw these images together. Anyone who's learned synthetic aperture imaging knows you need to have the phase to do that inverse Fourier transform and keep the high resolution. If you didn't measure phase, it's not going to work, right? So this becomes a phase retrieval problem plus a synthetic aperture problem. Um, and that's what we're good at is phase retrieval. And there's a lot of work. This is sort of an analogy to a Fourier analog of this that's used a lot in X-ray. So there's a lot of like, background research that's been happening on these sorts of algorithms. But the fundamental idea is that if you capture images from all of these different parts of the Fourier space, in our case, by lighting up different LEDs, so each circle here represents the Fourier space coverage of a single image captured by a single LED turned on, then uh, you can stitch them together. And so I want you to notice that these circles are severely overlapping, and this is creating massive redundancy, but also some diversity that we need for the phase retrieval. So it's not that exciting how we solve the problem. We throw it into an inverse problem, and then we solve an optimization. So we can formulate our forward problem as the measurements we take are some function of the object and the pupil function, which is our microscopes, this circle, um, and that aberrations within it. And we p simply just throw this into a, an optimization and solve it. It's not quite that simple, um, but it is just an optimization problem. OK, so uh, if you have your forward model, and we do, we know how, what's happening when we change our illumination angles, then we need to solve the inverse problem, solve for x. I say it's just an optimization. It's not quite that simple, of course. Um, but it is solving a nonlinear optimization. So y equals ax is your typical uh, problem you might be trying to solve. Ours is a little more difficult because it's a phase retrieval, meaning we have these nonlinear intensity measurements. Um, but we can solve it in similar ways. So uh, if you've taken basic optimization, you know, you've heard of gradient descent. Just update your estimate every time so that it goes in the direction that's creating the biggest change. Um, uh, for the better. Um, so your cost function's moving along to find its, its global minimum here, right? Uh, this is a non-convex, non-convex, non-linear problem with millions of variables, in fact, gigapixel of variables. And so things get a little bit complicated there. But basically, we just go after these second order methods, which are just um, more carefully designed optimization updates. And this is uh, how they perform relative to the first order methods. So the first order methods are fast and simple, but they get caught in these local minima all the time. Second order methods are just less likely to do so. Um, but they're a lot more, they're slower because they, they require more update. So uh, we've played around with a lot of different ones, but gradient descent, which is Gertrude Saxton for anyone who's played around with phase retrieval, is a gradient descent method. They converge so slowly that it's completely impractical. So you, you really should be using one of these uh, second order methods, or these are quasi second order methods. Here's an example. So this is Gertrude Saxon is gradient descent. And this is a particular example in which it created all kinds of artifacts because it couldn't find the correct solution, whereas the second order method did find the correct solution. But it was really, really slow. And we're trying to do these gigantic gigapixel images. I'll show you later. We're doing videos. So uh, we can't afford to go so slow. So we work with this sort of uh, compromise somewhere in between. Not much loss of quality, but we get very fast and robust solutions. So how you choose your algorithm matters. That's the point there. OK, so the next problem that we tackled, we're all about we want to do live samples. We want to go fast. And we've been doing all of this overlapping stuff. That means that I'm collecting 10 times more data than I'm reconstructing. And that doesn't sit well with me. It's very inefficient, and I don't like it. And you cannot simply throw away 9 tenths of those images. It just won't converge if you do that. So how can you, com how can you do it? Well, we need to design different capture mechanisms. And so what we did was we went after multiplexing. And this is the idea that if I do a sequential scan, I'm filling in one circle at a time, so I can get at this large space bandwidth product, but it's going to be slow, because I have to take a lot of images. Whereas uh, in the multiplexing strategy, you turn on multiple LEDs at once. And so every image you take is a linear combination of the images you would have gotten with a different set of these LEDs. And so you can fill in this space bandwidth product quicker. And the only caveat is that you don't know if this is actually going to converge. Can your algorithm actually detangle um, all of these images from a, a smaller set of data? So what we wanted to do was get back to one-to-one. -to -one. So we try to reduce our data down towards 
the uh, number of data collected is equal to number reconstructed, a number of pixels. And um, I wouldn't want to go beyond that without any priors because you can't guarantee, you wouldn't expect it to work, right? Of course it works or I wouldn't be showing you this. But here's what we do. We capture the first sort of the low frequency stuff in these four images with the half circles because that gets you to twice the resolution for free. Um, and then we take eight LEDs on at a time, a bunch of images with eight LEDs at a time. That's what this pattern I was showing you at the beginning looked like. It looks like a disco party in the lab. Um, but once you take all of these images, uh, we can show that it works. So here's our low resolution. This is uh, just a sample that you can buy from a microscope company. And uh, low resolution image, if I sequentially scan all the LEDs and reconstruct this thing, it takes about 10 minutes, I can get a nice picture. But then if I use my multiplexing strategy, I can with only 40 images and 0.4 seconds, I can reconstruct essentially the same thing. So we're using a lot less data, but only because we're getting rid of a redundancy that existed before. So it is not compressed sensing, no priors on the object. OK, so this is going to be really, really important as we try to scale up, which we haven't done fully yet. But as you try to scale up, you're trying to fill in more of your Fourier space. And the area increases quadratically with resolution. So you better start thinking about how you capture the data. Um, but for now, we're sort of sticking to these factors of seven or so of resolution improvement in either direction. And then we can get live samples. So we're looking at cancer cells here. But I can zoom in and see subcellular features. This one's going to split. It curls up in a ball, and then it will divide into multiple cells. This is a quantitative phase image captured over a relatively long time scale. And you can watch this, these cancer cells dividing. You can imagine why that's useful research. OK, so once you've got these giant uh, captured data sets and you're reconstructing these huge images, you really have to start to think about um, throwing the doctor out of the loop um, and having the, the algorithm or the computer not only reconstruct the image but analyze it for you. So we've been doing a little bit of stuff around uh, automated segmentation of these images that you get out, um, mostly with off-the-shelf hardware or off-the-shelf software like Salt Profiler. But this can be really important when you have these giant data sets. You don't want a doctor just looking at these by hand anymore. Okay. So the last thing I'll mention about this LED array microscope is uh, everything I said before was really for thin samples. We were treating it like a bunch of cells on a plate, 2D objects, very thin. And now I want to say, what happens when your object's thick? So it's 3D now. Ah, and what happens when your object's thick? Things change. So this is a thick object in the sense that it's two thin objects at different depths. One's in front of focus, and one is behind focus. And as I shift my illumination around, what happens? They appear to shift relative to each other because they're on opposite sides of focus. The faster they shift, the further they are away from focus. The stuff right in focus won't shift at all. So basically, there, there is depth information in this image, right? in these sets of images. And this is exactly what your light field talks about. This is exactly what light field imaging is. You measure things at different angles. This is, happens to be illumination instead of detection. And then you can reconstruct digitally refocused stuff. Um, so you can sort of map this out geometrically. Where things would have gone, it just follows the, the shift amount just follows these geometric relations. So it's very easy to undo. This is exactly what light fields undoes. Um, so we did exactly that. This is a uh, digitally synthesized focus stack through the object. You see one comes into focus, and then at a later depth, another one comes into focus, simply by doing the light field shift and add algorithms. OK, but there's a problem. Um, light fields does not directly translate to microscopy for reasons I spoke of earlier that wave optics matters in microscopy. And light fields is fixing geometric shifts. Geometric shifts are absolutely ray optics. And there's actually more than that happening as things, as things go through focus. They're not just shifting sideways when you change your illumination angle. They're also diffracting outwards. And so because that's not accounted for, we have these problems. So let me take a minute to say what this is. So these are the two depth planes. We put these resolution targets at two different depth planes, just tilted relative to each other. And uh, so one comes into focus at this plane, one comes into focus at this plane. And if I physically focus on them, I can resolve these smaller features. But if I do this digital refocusing with a light field algorithm, I cannot. I'm just losing all of my resolution. And that's because I'm missing phase, because I haven't accounted for diffraction and wave optics effects. 
but we know how to do phase retrieval, so we simply put in our phase retrieval optimization, and now instead of solving for phase on a 2D plane, let's solve for two phases at two different 2D planes, which is uh, looking at the 3D phase. Once we do that, we can resolve, uh, we can resolve these smaller features and get back to the diffraction-limited resolution of the microscope. So it's, a, it's basically the wave optics version of light field imaging. OK. Um, so I just told you that I can take this same microscope with the same hardware and capture a set of images from different illumination angles. And in one case, I told you I can create this high resolution, super resolution image. In the other case, I can use the same data set and reconstruct 3D. And so the obvious question is, can I do both? Can I get 3D super resolution? And I want to show you in this simple case, we can. OK, so here's our two resolution targets, one on top of each other. So now we've zoomed out. We have um, a bigger field of view, but worse resolution. So now when I look at the physical focus, um, if I zoom in, I'm just simply not resolving the smaller features here. But if I do this uh, same process that I did before, except try to solve for 3D super resolution, I can, in fact, do so. And then I can resolve things that are up to um, the sum of the, the diffraction limit, the new diffraction limit for the super resolution case. Um, so this is just two planes, but we can, we can extend this to more planes and more complicated objects. All of this fits within the frameworks of uh, artificial neural networks. And there are some cool papers on the same sorts of models we're using being uh, exactly analogous to artificial neural networks. So it's non-convex, non-linear optimization. That is what neural networks are. These are the machine, uh, machine learning workhorse algorithms. And so you can relate it back to all of these crazy algorithms and things that are happening uh, in the machine learning community and start to think about that could help us. Um, but uh, it's a difficult neural network problem because we have a lot of pixels and we have a lot of depth planes. And we're trying to account for multiple scattering. So when when things scatter multiple times through the object, that's accounted for, but it also drastically increases the degrees of freedom in your solutions, so you can't be sure that you're going to converge on the correct solution. And so in this 3D case, we don't really know that we're always going to get the correct answer. We have to do a lot of heuristic testing, um, and we have to start out with very good initial guesses to be sure that we might get to the correct answer. So this is an uh, open problem in trying to prove that we get the right answer. In practice, we get good results. This is a little bit cheating. This is a slightly different setup we used here. But we're getting at the 3D refractive index map of uh, these are mouse embryo cells. And this is a synthetic focus stack passing through uh, in the third dimension. OK. Um, so. That's sort of like my LED array microscope pitch. I think it's such a cool instrument. Maybe a lot of people here aren't doing microscopy, but can take away some general ideas from the things that we've been uh, working on. But I think there's some general themes in computational imaging that can really apply to a lot of people. Um, and one of the themes that we have is accessibility. So we want to build microscopes that are really, really cheap and very, very easy to build, and that we can give you this complicated software that can run relatively quickly so that you can get this thing running and build it in your own lab. And that's one of the beauties of the LED array thing, is that you can do it so easily that other people can adopt this and use it themselves easily. So um, accessibility is not just about open sourcing your code. It's about the hardware, too. Make it cheap. Make it easy to buy. Um, don't make anything too fancy. Somehow against some of the like, very careful specifications that people often do. Um, but I'm really excited about this. Here's an example. This is a 3D printed microscope. And this is an LED array that was made by one of my students. It's a 3D printed dome. And he sticks all the LEDs in and hand solders them. Um, and then gets all the code running on an Android cell phone so that you can have this portable thing that, that you could make yourself in a, in a basic makerspace lab and achieve all of these sort of new microscope modalities that would be extremely expensive if you were to build them in a biological lab. So this is for a lot of the sort of under-resourced countries trying to do disease diagnosis at the point of care. Um, but for the microscope itself, we just... We just built this new, what we call quasi-dome, and the idea is that 
This was a really, like, took forever to build, and you have to hand solder 500 LEDs, so like, good luck convincing a biologist to do this. Um, this one is just five printed circuit boards. The LEDs are on the printed circuit boards, and we like to get to very high numerical apertures, so we want to come in at angles to the full 180 degrees. And you can do that just by making, it's five flat circuit boards with LEDs on them that make this little tent, and they just click together. You can build this thing in a matter of minutes. And then there's a 3D printed unit here that slides into the condenser unit on your microscope. So you can install this thing really quickly and build it. And the idea is to get these things out into labs and get people using them as easily as possible. So now we don't have to do any work to put it together, which is, was the main goal here. OK. Um, so the other like, super important aspect of accessibility is the dirty secret of computational imaging is that we have these models, these beautiful model for what my system is, A, and uh, try to solve for X. And we design these really nice algorithms. We check if they're noise sensitive. And then we build the system, and it's completely wrong. Um, so I think it's probably common. A lot of people here can appreciate that we spend a lot of time on calibration. Um, it doesn't go into the paper. You spend six hours calibrating this thing. Nobody sneeze. Take the pictures. Reconstruct the beautiful image, and then you know after you breathe a couple times, you can, it'll never work again until you do those calibration routines again. And when you go after very efficient indirect imaging, you have no choice but to accept that your image system is very sensitive, which is good, but also very sensitive to errors. And so when our, uh, when our forward models are, our systems are not quite a perfect fit to the models we've assigned them, we get weird artifacts, especially with these indirect algorithms doing it. And aberrations are a key one in our LED array microscope, as are the LED positions. They can be off by microns and create errors in our result. When you're trying to build up higher resolution, you better not be coming in. Uh, you try, if you're trying to build resolution to 100 nanometers, don't be coming in at like five microns off from where you thought you were, right? So these have always been a huge problem. And so a big theme in my lab is trying to do algorithmic self-calibration, which a lot of people are already doing. And the idea is just that you can potentially do the calibration in the inverse problem itself by introducing extra redundancy to your data. So just as an example, for Fourier tachography, the first times we ran it, if you don't calibrate the system, it looks like garbage. You're actually making the resolution worse by putting all these images together. Um, and after you calibrate it, you can get these nice images that actually match up with your theory and get you to those uh, resolution limits you expected. So what we've been doing a lot of, and this was happening before we came along, was to say like my system, my system model is basically this A matrix just describes the forward model. So it describes how my system changes, um, how an input affects the output. But now this model actually has some parameters to it, some calibration parameters. So if we treat the aberrations or the LED positions as like free parameters that we also need to optimize in our giant optimization problem, then we can potentially solve for those as well as the object that we're going after. And this makes the system so much more practical because you don't need to have fancy calibration. You don't need an expert in the room to tell you how to set up the system. And you can get things running quickly. So my student, Regina, hates doing calibration, and she really wanted to do this. So she came up with sort of algorithms for this particular case to, to solve for both the object and the calibration parameters. And I'm really excited about this going forward in all kinds of different uh, systems that we have in the lab, um, applying these ideas of self-calibration. OK, so I still have some more time, and I want to switch to a slightly different topic. So I've been talking about illumination coding, coding of illumination angles specifically in a microscope. Um, but uh, one thing that doesn't work for is fluorescence. So if you have a fluorescence uh, sample in your microscope, it doesn't care what angle it's illuminated from. And so none of this stuff works on fluorescence data. Um, and so when you talk about fluorescence, you pretty much always are talking uh, for computational imaging. You want to do detection side coding. So everything should happen after the object. And you can apply a lot of the same principles. Um, but, and we're eventually going to put the two together. But for now, I want to sort of like switch off these sort of coherent models and look at fluorescent, which is incoherent models, and detection side coding. So the light field camera is a great example. It's a really beautiful detection side coding. You put this lens lit array in, and it basically just one-to-one -one maps out your, your space information, x, and your angle information, theta. So if you analyze a light field camera with a lens lit array here, basically every pixel on the sensor is mapping out a box in this space angle plot. 
And that's great. It's super easy to interpret. You don't need to do any inverse problem to figure out where each thing came from. Um, but the bad news is you have a finite number of pixels, and you need to spread them across a four-dimensional piece of information, so you lose resolution. So uh, an interesting project we had in my lab was this challenge. Can I throw away the lensed array and use just like a rough piece of glass, a diffuser, instead? Um, and one of the main motivations for it was accessibility, because these lenslet arrays are really expensive, and to get them fabricated to high quality is really expensive. Uh, it takes a long time, and you're stuck with a single aperture size. So if you change the aperture size of your camera, you, can't, you need to change the aperture size on your lenslets, which means removing them and putting in a new lenslet array. So we wanted this sort of like generalized way of figuring out light fields from any glass surface that messes with the angles. So this is all on the sensor side. It's basically just a diffuser or a rough piece of glass in front of a sensor. And it's placed at a particular distance so that you've got these caustic patterns. But when you do that, you basically map, each pixel maps out uh, the linear sum of all the measurements you'd get through some area of this light field space. Um, and this is a severely multiplexed measurement which is also low resolution, but it's flexible, so it doesn't care what numerical aperture system is. And I think much more importantly, um, it's a multiplex measurement, meaning it enables compressed sensing. So I can start to solve underdetermined problems by adding priors because each of my measurements is actually a linear combination of other measurements. OK, that's a bit abstract. Let's just look at what it does. So this is what it looks like. Um, we literally just glue a piece. It's like this privacy glass. Um, stickers that you put on your windows so your neighbors can't see you. And you, you stick it in front of a sensor, um, like a, a, half a, a couple millimeters usually in this case. And you take a picture. So this is, uh, it looks like a bunch of speckle because we're taking a picture through a diffuser. Not surprising. But from this single image, we can reconstruct the in focus in the back, in focus in the front, or somewhere in between where neither is in focus. So we're getting the same sort of depth information. Um, and in fact, we can just solve for 3D objects in this case. So we take a single picture that looks like this and reconstruct a three-dimensional object. This is, a, this is a 2D resolution target, but it's tilted in the third dimension. Or here's a, a, just a leaf, a little leaf that we found somewhere. Um, and the cool thing about this is that we're still working out all the artifacts, but the, the cool thing about this is that we can solve underdetermined problems. So here we're actually solving for a number of voxels in our 3D image that's 20 times larger than the number of pixels in the 2D image we captured. And you can put in all kinds of priors if you have them to figure out this problem. So where we really want to go with this is to look at uh, neural activity in mouse brains. So our collaborators look at mouse brains. They want to watch them in action. And they have this awesome magic where if the neuron lights up, or if the neuron fires, it will light up. So whenever there's neural activity, it will light up. So you see a bright spot wherever that neuron lights up. And not very many neurons are on at once, so you can assume that's pretty sparse. Um, so people have looked at light field imaging for this problem, but they run into two things. One, wave optics. Um, so wave optics that we can solve. But the other one is scattering. And the, our approach to this is to just like forget about creating a beautiful 2D image. And uh, we don't care what the neuron looks like. We just care to distinguish it from the one next door. So we want distinguishability and localization in 3D so we can tell which neurons are on. But we don't care about the image of the neuron. And this gives us a lot of uh, flexibility to design around. So we're measuring something that's basically like light field information. And light field is space and angle information, but that's what gives you the 3D. But what does scattering do? It spreads out angles. And at different points in space, it spreads out the angles more and more. So uh, measuring angle and space information should be useful for scattering, for undoing scattering uh, light. So now uh, we have a similar approach. We have a forward problem, we have an inverse problem, and we need to decide what the forward problem is. That's the hardest part, and then solve for x. So the decide what the forward problem is is well, we want x to we want to solve for x, which is our 3D object. We want to solve for it from these 4D light field measurements, um, and we want that model to be really general. So we want it has to include wave optics, so it should be a wave model, a coherent and partially coherent. Um, it should include scattering, so we're only going to statistically include scattering, but statistically in this four-dimensional, um, higher-dimensional correlation space, and volumetric. So we, we don't have a 2D object behind a scattering media. We have 
3D objects within scattering media, which is a more difficult problem than what a lot of uh, textbooks look at. OK, so what's the solve for x? Put in all the priors you have. So we want to say that only one or two neurons is on at once within a given volume. Um, it's going to include multiple scattering sort of naturally, but it has to be compressible. So we need to have not very many neurons on at once. And here's what our, the key to our forward model is that every point source in this space angle map basically maps out a line. And so the x crossing tells you where it is along the x, the lateral dimension. And then the slope of this line tells you its depth. If you pull this back further, the slope gets less. So if I add, uh, if I put a, a point source on, on the focal plane, then it's just a straight up line. Or on the other side, it slopes the other way. So now we can get our 3D localization by fitting to lines, right? This is great. So we can fit this thing to a bunch of lines. Actually, this is just x, theta x. I also have y, theta y. So I'm really fitting to a 2D hyperplane in a four-dimensional uh, matrix. Um, but we want to do scattering stuff, right? So what does scattering do? Well, it scatters stuff. It blurs these lines out. But the cool thing is that lines that are deeper, for example, this one's deeper in the scattering material. It went through more scattering material. So it will be more blurred. So deeper point sources blur more but they also tilt more. So this tilt angle is tied to how fat these blobs are. So we can fit to a bunch of blobs with a lot of information about how fat they should be. And this adds a lot of information to your inverse problem, um, which is relatively easy to add in when you're doing iterative uh, solvers. So here's a real experiment. This is a zebrafish brain. These are the two lobes of the brain. And uh, whoops, the video didn't play. Uh, well, you take a video with this light field information. And at every frame, we can reconstruct the 3D positions of which neurons are active during that time frame. And so then we can make this 3D map of activity of the, each neuron in the brain. This is about 1,000 neurons. And we're trying to work to push this to hopefully a million. But I don't know when that's going to happen. So the last question I want to leave with is this idea that uh, sort of like the holy grail that we always think about. Can I completely undo scattering? And people have figured out how to completely undo scattering at a single point within thick tissue. But I want to do like a 3D image. Can I completely undo scattering? And I think that the answer is you could if you could fully map out each scattering event within this volume. So this gets insane because you, your degrees of freedom increases exponentially with each layer of scattering through the material. But if you can figure out the right sort of basis set, you might be able to completely undo scattering um, if you can map out all of the scattering events, if you can find the right model in which the scattering events are sparse and or brute force collect a lot more data. So you need diversity, you need redund redundancy. Um, so both more data and better models. For example, you can access all of these degrees of freedom by having illumination detection coding, but you might not need to use all of them if you can make these sort of multiplex measurements to get at them indirectly. So we've been in this realm. People have been doing megapixels per second forever. We're doing gigapixels per second now. But I think like where you're going to see us starting to make really successful undoing of scattering is in this terapixels per second range. And we're not that far off from being able to do this. Um, but this is a, a key goal of our new center at Berkeley for computational imaging that pulls together um, optics people, microscopists, um, algorithms people, fancy uh, high performance visual computing uh, languages, and uh, some people working on similar stuff in MRI. So I'm really excited to go in that sort of direction. And that's all I'll say, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation. I guess one question, uh, you alluded to it a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about what plans you have for commercialization, uh, especially of the low-cost technologies? Yeah, so we have a hybrid mix of just like open sources and give it away and uh, actually commercializing. So the more foundation stuff, anything developed on that, we're just open source, give it away. And we, we actually work a lot on making, we're trying to release some like really friendly packages like open source hardware and software. Here's how you build it. Um, the LED array stuff, um, these quasi domes with the panels, I have two students who just started a company around trying to sell those. Um, so hopefully that, that's the idea is dissemination could be relatively cheap, relatively easy for us to 
replicate them, um, but that's trying to commercialize it ourselves. We also talk with the microscope companies, um, but they won't let me tell you what they say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, hi Laura. Uh, back here. Hi, thank, thanks. That was just really uh, great. I, I have a question about the use of sparsity mm -hmm. with the neural recordings. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way that you can optically... So people who study the nervous system are studying it because they don't know what's going on in there. And uh, if we knew it was sparse, we probably you know, would have solved this thing a long time ago. So is there some way you can check from your data per se as to whether the sparsity assumption is met? Because that in itself would be valuable. I know you can reconstruct um, if it's sparse, but can you actually check that as part of your measurements? Sort of. You can't check absolutely, but you, so if we know, like if we know each neuron's life field signature, then we can figure out which ones came into play in this image. And so basically the contrast of the image is, is the sparsity. So if the image that you collect is just a big white blob, like if all the neurons were on at once, it would be a big white blob. So the algorithm wouldn't solve and it wouldn't be sparse. Um, there's things we can do to play with sparsity. So I think you're starting to get at like validation is a huge issue for this because we're trying to do 3D imaging with at speed, and these things are changing in real time, these mice are moving. Um, and so validation is a big issue for us. Actually, the setup that we have has a beam splitter, and, and there's a two photon system that's like they're on the same path. So we can, we've been correlating with two photons, sort of treating that as ground truth, whether it is or not, I'm not sure. Um, but you can only do that for static samples. And so the live samples, we don't have a good validation for it. We can force the uh, neural activity to be pretty sparse just by anesthetizing these things. But um, yeah, this is a huge issue for us to figure out when we're correct. Or we can make fake LEDs lighting up within 3D and scattering media, but it's very unrealistic. And this all matters um, when, you're, when you're having like tricky regularizers in there. Yeah, you mentioned that you use a uh, called aperture. What kind of code aperture and what is the numerical aperture uh, value that you guys you are using? Um, so I probably was talking about that in terms of this diffuser camera, which is a little weird because it's a lensless camera, so it's not specifically coded aperture in the sense that there is no Fourier plane or pupil plane um, to code, but it is like coded aperture. You're patterning not real space or Fourier space, but somewhere in between. <laughs> Uh, in a known way. Um, so it's a little bit different, but it's quite similar. Like our algorithms treat it as a convolution. So it's very similar in practice. Um, and the numerical aperture is one. <laughs> if your object right up against your sensor. Um, so the further away your object is, the less angles that you're getting. But there's, uh, there's no lens in there. It's very high. Um, so if your object, it depends. So our diffuser camera is like a centimeter big, and we're putting objects like around here, right? Um, so if you go by the numerical aperture on the object side, which is not what you're supposed to do in analyzing numerical apertures, um, then it, it drops off as you go further away. So your resolution will drop as you go further away. So we have a last question back here. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, I'm thinking about the uh, calibration and about um, optimizing your hardware. Have you thought about using different types of filter um, along with your beam splitters to get at the scattering issue, um, looking at cutting down to monochromatic light and seeing how that behaves in your medium? Um, yeah, that's a good point. So uh, if you color filter to make it more monochromatic, you'll have like less blurred images. That should be good. But you're losing light. Um, and we're usually pretty photon starved, so we don't like to put any color filters except for the ones we have to put in to separate the fluorescence illumination from uh, emission. That's great. Thank you.